Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Rob Cowell, President of the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology. And on behalf of Food in Canada, Canada's national food and beverage processing magazine and CFST, welcome to Table Talks, where we bring you regular webinars that give you access to some of the leaders in the food and beverage industry. Today's topic is the impact of COVID-19 on the agri-food system. Uh, and before I introduce the session, I want to mention that if you have any questions, you can write them in the question box and our moderator will ask our speaker some of these questions um, and our speaker will attempt to answer them before the end of this session. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ricky Yada. In 2014, Professor Ricky Yada was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC. Prior to UBC, Dr. Yada was at the University of Guelph, where he held numerous leadership roles, including Assistant Vice President Research, Canada Research Chair in Food Protein Structure, Scientific Director of the Advanced Foods and Materials Network, and founding member of the Food Institute. He is currently the North American Editor of Trends in Food Science and Technology, and he also serves on the editorial boards of several journals. Uh, and uh, today's moderator is Jenny Tian. Jenny is currently a product developer for Loblaw Company Limited and has product development experience in both dairy and commercial bakery. Jenny holds a bachelor's degree in food science from McGill University and a master of science degree with specialization in food science from University of British Columbia. Jenny also serves as director at large on the CFST National Board. So please welcome Dr. Ricky Yada and Jenny Tian. So thanks, Rob, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone in the audience today for joining us. Um, I hope you're enjoying our campfire, roasting our marshmallows, and eating the hot dog. So Dr. Yada, very looking forward to be speaking with you today on the impacts of COVID-19 and uh, the impacts on the agri-food system today. So in your opinion, what do you think are some of the challenges that we are facing today in um, agri-food system as a result of COVID-19? Well, thank you, Jenny. Um, maybe before I answer that question, I'll give the audience a bit of a, a backstory of how we got to the platform that we're using today, which is kind of a late night talk show host uh, format. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, we had the pleasure of hosting Michael Poland. So uh, I think many of you probably recognize the name, uh, the author of The Omnivore's Dilemma, um, a wonderful interviewee, right? So um, when Michael came in uh, to Vancouver, <clears throat> we had a conversation of what format would we take uh, to do the kind of talk that he was going to give and we discussed the regular format of he's the teacher the audience is the student and I said hey Michael would you like to do a interviewer interviewee kind of format and he said yeah sure because it seems to be much more interactive and engages the audience a little bit more and it was a wonderful evening we held it at the Orpheum Theater so People who are familiar with Vancouver know the Orpheum Theatre. It's one of the large uh, theatres. We had 3,000 people attend in person, and it was also simulcasted out. And so it was a wonderful evening. Um, I have to admit, my favourite question, what asking Michael was, Michael, you know, you're a big advocate of healthy food choices, but do you have a weak moment? Uh, and in that weak moment, uh, what food do you like to eat, you know? And without a, missing a beat, he goes, you know, I do a lot of talks. I, um, you know, travel a lot, but oftentimes I drive. And he says, I go to the place where you probably wouldn't think of, of having healthy choices. And that's the food store at a gas station. And I go, wow, you're human. And I said, well, what do you buy? And he says, my favorite food is Cracker Jacks. And I go, oh, God, Michael, as a kid, and some of the people who are listening today or watching today are probably way too young to uh, recognize the term Cracker Jacks or the product Cracker Jacks. But when I was a kid, it's caramel popcorn in a box. And the thing that I really wanted was not the caramel corn, 
but the little prize you got in it, which was probably one one hundredth of the cost of the popcorn and the and the packaging material. So Michael said, "No, I like the caramel corn." So at that moment, you know, Michael scored a huge number of brownie points with me. But it was a, a fun interview. If you ever have a chance, he, I know he was at the University of Guelph when I was there, um, but I had the opportunity to interview him again. And he has a tie to Vancouver. His, his sister is Tracy Poland, uh, Michael Fox's wife. And so Michael Fox grew up in um, Burnaby, a suburb of Vancouver. So he was visiting family too. I also want to thank Jack and Heidi uh, for the graphics. Um, because this morning uh, somebody wrote me and said, oh, I wish it really was a campfire talk and so that we could have real s'mores and hot dogs. I think it was just s'mores actually. And so, you know, this is our substitution. Uh, by the way, it comes in vegan form, both the s'more and hot dogs for, for those of you who are uh, of the vegan um, perspective. So you can enjoy those. Um, we'll probably have to figure out a way to get them to you. The other thing I wanted to say, Jenny, before I talk uh, about your challenge is I really am glad to be with my peeps in CIFST. Um, I was fortunate to join when I was an undergraduate student and I was fortunate enough at that time to get a food industry scholarship from CIFST. And I think that helped a lot in defining my path forward. Uh, I think uh, I had the opportunity to give the convocation talk at um, Guelph a couple of years ago uh, to the graduating class of the Ontario Agricultural College. And I, and I talked about my um, career path. And I think many of you who are on the, uh, watching the webinar today, this probably resonates with you uh, more by accident than by design was the talk, uh, title of my talk because I think that's what happens to many of us. Uh, we find opportunities and pursue them. So with that, Jenny, sorry for that long-winded backstory, but um, now on to the question you asked me. Jesus. <laughs> no Hope problem, Dr. Yeah. That's great insights for sure. Yeah, hopefully I can remember your question. But, but you know, to say we, we're being, we've been in and are in unprecedented times is a complete understatement, right? I don't think we've ever uh, been in a situation as we are today. And what it really has identified for me right off the get-go is the fact that how unprepared we were and what we don't have in place uh, as we mm -hmm. met the various challenges of COVID. So that is something that was is an overriding rubric. But, you know, with us, for us who are in the agri-food area, um, there's been a number of papers uh, that have been recently written about COVID and the impact on the agri-food system. And, you know, what came really to light for me, and it, it was reinforced to me, was a paper that came out. And, um, Jenny, what I can do is, Maybe I'll, after this, I'll post it, the reference online, and so people can see it. But it was a paper written by my uh, former colleague, still is a colleague at the University of Guelph, Gaitu Halu, who's in the um, Ag Econ uh, department. And Gaitu, and this is a, a article that came out in the Canadian Journal of Ag Economics and it's economic thoughts on COVID-19 for Canadian food processors. So it's just a recent paper. But what it did reinforce for me, Jenny, was how big the food industry really is. And he's specifically talking about uh, the food processing industry. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna quote a couple of things from that paper that tells people how important we as a group, food scientists, technologists, and the broad spectrum of food science and technology, we really are. So I quote from this paper, the food manufacturing sector plays a fundamental role in Canada's economy. First in 2018, the food and beverage processing industry contributed to, to approximately 17% 
of manufacturing revenue and 1.7% to the Canadian GDP. Second, the food processing industry is Canada's leading employer in manufacturing commodities. Third, Food manufacturing is the largest buyer of primary agricultural commodities. And in 2016, food processing used approximately 50% of raw agricultural products. And then finally, also the food and beverage industry supplies approximately 75% of all processed and beverage products to the domestic market. So that's an, you know, just a reinforcement of how important we are. But the other thing that I wanted to quote, Jenny, um, another passage from this paper was the demographics of our industry. And it's, I think many of you who are watching uh, know this, but just again, to reinforce, you know, the demographics of the industry. One of the structures of Canada's food processing industry is a high proportion of SMEs there are approximately 6,210 food processing establishments in Canada in 2019, where 26% of the establishments have less than five employees, 64% have between five and 99 employees, 9% have between 100 and 500 employees, and only 1% of the establishments have more than 500 employees. And this is from the Government of Canada 2020, so recent statistics. Most importantly, micro and small businesses account for 90% of employers in Canada's food processing industry in 2019. And in 2017, SMEs employed 90% of the private sector workforce. Again, this is a statistic that came out of the Government of Canada in 2020. So, Jenny, with those passages, you know, this is how big and how important we are to Canada. But I would argue that globally, this is probably true in most jurisdictions of the uh, world with regards to the agri-food industry. So with that, you know, Jenny, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges. And um, what I'll also do is then maybe in your further questioning, you can ask me for some more details. So I'll probably start off with a shopping list of things that I observed, and then we can get into some of the details around some of those challenges. I'm going to preface this by saying for every challenge, I think there's an opportunity for us in the food industry to take advantage of this and basically retool and reinvent ourselves because what I think we're all going to realize, and if we haven't already realized right now, that there is going to be a new norm. Right. And what that and what that real you know new norm looks like, I'm not sure. I don't think many of us do. I think you know you have to ask somebody like Malcolm Gladwell, the futurist, right, to say what would this look like. So, Jenny, is it okay that maybe I give the shopping list and then you can then probe me on some of those challenges, and then I can talk about maybe some of the opportunities. Yeah, I think that sounds great, Doctor Yada. Why why don't we start there? Okay, and you know, this isn't meant to be comprehensive, but you know, um, and I want to thank Heidi and Jack who are in the background because they had asked for an abstract, I think, which was posted on the website. Um, so there's many challenges. Um, I guess one of the ones that I saw, and I think most of us experienced, was this whole notion of <clears throat> panic buying, you know. Uh, for argument's sake, uh, people were just buying up flour and baking products. And that was kind of an interesting thing to me. And maybe it was 
affiliated, I'm sure it was affiliated with uh, isolation, the, the need for isolation, but, you know, things like toilet paper and things like that, clean, sanitizers, you know, you could barely find things. And then you have the people who are being completely opportunistic and taking advantage of that. So that was something that I noticed um, quite early in the, in the lockdown. The other thing, um, and for those of you who know UBC, um, and, and Jenny, thank you for following me uh, to uh, UBC from Guelph. Uh, just as a little bit of a backstory, I first got to know Jenny when she was a high school student uh, in Guelph. And uh, I don't know how you got on to me, Jenny, but uh, I ended up helping you out with a science fair project. And uh, since that time, Jenny and I have been in contact and you know, we were kind of sad that she went to McGill to do her bachelor's <laughs> degree. Uh, but she did see the light. She changed from nutrition to food science and then came to UBC. And it's wonderful, Jenny, that you're doing so well uh, post uh, UBC. Um, but, you know, the other thing that, um, as I said, if you know UBC, we have a dairy, uh, a fully functional dairy, which is about an hour and a half from Vancouver. It's in a place called Agassiz. It's a, it's a commercial dairy. It's 500 head of dairy cows. Uh, we milk about 250. Well, the Fraser Valley, as people may or may not realize, is one of the most intense agricultural areas in Canada. Um, of course, it's in the province too, that it's high intensity. But there were stories of dairies having to dump their milk right. because of you know, supply chain issues. And Jenny, you probably, and everybody realize that when restaurants and fast food chains close down who are large users of products such as milk, horticultural commodities, there was a surplus of material. And so that was interesting. And that, you know, parlays not only into lack of processing capacity, but also the issue of food waste. And we can, we can go back to those issues uh, a little bit later on. Um, the whole area of zoonosis and, and you know, um, was something that was very interesting to me. So uh, the deans of uh, agriculture and vet colleges uh, from across the country uh, meet as a group. Um, and so, this whole notion of where did COVID start? Was it from an animal that got transferred to humans and then it became the pandemic is an interesting thing for me. And so this is an, another area that I think, um, Jenny, is a challenge, you know, how did it start? But again, there's an opportunity there. Food safety, you know, you know I think we in Canada pride ourselves on the type of products that we produce, uh, high quality uh, and consistent high quality and safe products. And so it was interesting uh, to see when, you know, large animal processing facilities are, and it didn't even have to be animal processing, any processing facilities where you got basically an outbreak of COVID among the employees. Um, I think there was some thought that uh, could we actually get COVID from not only the people who work there, but from the products that were produced. You know, so that was an interesting thing for me. Um, worker shortages, you know, um, you know, so part of our faculty advisory board is the chair of our faculty advisory board is a graduate of our faculty, but a large blueberry producer in the Valley. And, you know, his challenge, you know, right now, in fact, and just months preceding to right now, is the whole issue of uh, workers and, you know, foreign workers uh, getting them across the border, um, you know, them having to isolate. But he also is uh, vertically integrated. So not only does he produce blueberries, but he processes blueberries. And so he freezes them or dries them. But he said to me, 
you know, a lot of the people who work in his plants are domestic, you know, from around the area. And he was having trouble getting domestic workers into his processing plants. And I'm not sure if this is happening where you work, uh, Jenny, and some of your, you know, uh, companies that you obtain manufacturing from, but there was a whole food safety issue. People were afraid to go into those plants, right? And with social distancing, you know, how are we going to actually manage, you know, the kind of scenario that we have gotten used to in processing plants where people have often stood side by side in looking at products as they go down a line. So I'll talk about an opportunity there and you can probe me on some of the opportunities. So that's an issue. The whole issue as they talk about parm, uh, parm beans is the fellow I'm talking about, but the whole issue of uh, local food supply and food security is a big issue. I think that has been highlighted by COVID. You know, the reliance on what we can consume from the products that are grown locally. Um, because, you know, we saw basically the closure of borders. You know, it was to people, right, that people were restricted from traveling. But in a scenario that I don't think is unimaginable. You could see borders closing so that the importation of products from around the world would be restricted. And so, you know, as much as we've gotten used to the availability of products in our local grocery stores, you know, and just before we started the webinar, we were talking as a group of, you know, the kind of products you can get in your grocery stores. But we're so used to, I think, having the availability of things which, when I was growing up, were a real novelty or were even unknown. So when I was growing up, the whole notion of having kiwi fruit, believe it or not, was something that was rare right? It was a treat. And now, you know, you go into the store and kiwi for that, ah, you know, it's there, 365. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering, am I wearing shorts? Yes, I'm wearing shorts. So I'm not disappointing you. Uh, in Vancouver, it's a little bit easier, 365. Not so much in Guelph, but it was a little bit uh, challenging during November, December, January, minus 20. Not so easy. Um, but, you know, going back to the availability of foods. And so, you know, is that an opportunity, right? And I think tied into that local thing is the whole notion of the importance of food processing and food preservation. And so, you know, I talked about just as a preamble, the importance of food processing and you know the food industry to Canada's economy, right? Both in terms of dollar value, employment, blah blah blah. But you know, I think again, what COVID has really identified for me, um, Jenny, is how important it is that food processing is with us. Um, and I think back to the days when I was a child, and my mother and grandmother would harvest things from our little garden and would can or freeze things. And, you know, you think about what that did was it increased availability, accessibility of those food products um, that we could have. You know, maybe we didn't make it to the next year, but it, it helped us, you know, have beans or whatever uh for a good portion of the year and so that's something that that really has been kind of highlighted and then maybe jenny i'll finish off by talking about this whole notion of online you know um and some of the wonderful things about online but some of the chal challenges i think of online and so Online buying, right? I think 
we're moving more and more towards online buying. And I'm sure that many of you who are watching this webinar are participants in online buying. But then it got extrapolated to not only, you know, buying meals, but also groceries, right? And so, you know, Uber, Skip the Dish, you know, all of those uh, kind of online systems to actually um, purchase food and have it delivered. Grocery stores, um, I'm not sure what's what happened in Ontario, but in, in BC, there's uh, a big food chain called Save On. Uh, they were doing online delivery. And I think there were, you know, uh, private transportation um, individuals who were, you know, basically doing uh, online delivery, similar to Uber kind of doing. But that was interesting to me because that was a system, I think, which, you know, you could do it if you had the means to, right? Mm -hmm. And so the whole notion of, you know, accessibility again was affected by really, do you have the economic wherewithal to do that? And you can well imagine that, you know, people who don't have the economic means to do that were really hooped. Um, you know, maybe the opportunity was for those small convenience stores such as 7-Eleven or, or Max Milk to then become a much more comprehensive kind of convenience store more than just, you know, the pop and chips and, you know, uh, juice kind of thing. And I think we've seen that happen, but there's a huge economic, socioeconomic issue here about accessibility of food. And then, you know, it parlays into nutrition. And, you know, um, I, I don't know if people have or hear or listen to uh, Brian Goldman, um, uh, who is on CBC, he, used, uh, he usually does uh, black art, white coat. He's, a fan, he's an emergency doctor. Uh, he's doing a program on the weekend called The Dose. And I happen to listen to, it's a podcast, on uh, the effect of COVID on people's health. And so I'll, I'll speak to an issue that I think um, is probably near and dear to all of us who are on the webinar, you know, health and well-being and nutrition. And he jokingly said, and I don't think, I, maybe it wasn't attributed to Dr. Goldman, but he said, you know, the 19 refers to the average weight gain of people during the isolation. And I know that, you know, some of the people I've talked to said, oh my God, you know, uh, I don't get physical activity, I put on weight. And then, you know, you talk about some of the risk factors of COVID, you know, obesity, diabetes, heart conditions. Well, you know, you think, wow, weight gain is all contributors to those kind of things. And so, are we going to see a bump in, you know, susceptibility as, you know, in BC, our public health officer, Bonnie Henry, has been, I think, an exemplar of how to manage COVID. But we're not immune from the second wave. The young people are going out, you know, and uh, they're, um, you know, being contagious. They're doing these things that aren't social distance, I, I think. Uh, you know, like many of us who were 16, 17, uh, I think our thought was we're invincible. <laughs> I still think that's probably what people think they are, but now we're seeing the ramifications of that. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of issues, uh, I think, Jenny, that have been highlighted for me um, with, a, with a lens of agri-food, because that's what our faculty does. Um, and hopefully those, some of those points resonate with uh, the people who are watching this webinar. And Jenny, we can now talk about opportunities. 
Well, Dr. Yada, thank you. That was a lot of insights and thank you for providing yeah. them. So before we go in depth with opportunities, um, I was just wondering, so in your opinion, going back to some of the challenges, do you feel that as a nation, Canada or even provincial wide, is there anything we could have done better to um, allow us to meet these challenges knowing or unknowingly that it was coming? And secondly, on your note on the online shopping and ordering everything online with the technology um, that we're using these days, do you feel that Canada is behind in terms of using technology in our day-to-day -day lives? Yeah, okay. So Jenny, uh, the first question really, um, so you asked me about challenges, right? And could we, is Canada really, ahead or you know how, what are your your views on that um i i think you know we've done a pretty good job of managing things but i'll say one of the things that and i'll go back to you know even the supply chain thing right when we had a surplus of certain things uh i've often used the word resiliency right the ability to move quickly to meet a challenge. That's something I don't think uh, we had a lot of resiliency. We could have done a better job. And I'll say, Jenny, maybe the challenge here, and this is a discussion that happens with the deans of Ag and Vet. I think sometimes what I would say is that the food industry sometimes has been a victim of its own success. Right. So, you know, as I started off again and, you know, cited statistics from Gay Lu's, um, uh, Gay Two's uh, paper, you know, the whole economic driver. One of the big challenges has been to get research money. Right. And this is kind of self serving, but, you know, to the academics and even to the industry to get research money to do innovation. Right. And it's complex because the food industry sometimes um, is an industry that's viewed as a high volume, low margin industry. They don't have a lot of what I would say disposable income to contribute. You go to the government and you go, is there any possibility of additional support? And yes, there was some, you know, um, monies that were. Uh, targeted for you know the food industry as a result of COVID, but I think we needed to be much more innovative about how we address some of these things, and that's I think Jenny has been the challenge for us in Canada, and I would say you know for argument's sake if you use the comparator of the Netherlands, which is often used as the high water mark. I bet you they probably met the challenges with more resiliency than Canada did, just because of the investment that they do make and the partnering that they do have with industry to address strategic needs, right? And it's so difficult for us in Canada to do that. So hopefully that answered your first question. And on to your second question with regards to online. I don't know, Jenny, to be honest, whether or not we're doing better or worse than other jurisdictions. I think, you know, it gives opportunities for the various companies who manage the data for, you know, online shopping. And I think this is probably true of your company. You know, every time you scan a product as you go through the checkout, the retailer is getting information about your buying trends, right? And I would say that would be true of when you do online food ordering, right? And so I think with the inclusion of what they call artificial intelligence and that's a term that we often use. I, I'm still trying to grapple with what that really means, but I think it's basically, you know, how computers actually mimic how our minds work. 
and process data that we get in and come up to some conclusions. You think how important that is because whether it be a retailer like Loblaws or one of the restaurants now that are opening up, um, they're looking for buying trends. So they know now probably more about you than you know about you with regards to what do you buy. And if you're preparing a menu, okay, and maybe we'll get to the day where when you go to one of these providers of online shopping or you know whether it be groceries or food the menu will be customized to your likes and dislikes because you know the days of having that 20 page menu where you kind of flip through and you try to decide what you're going to order i think with what we're seeing with you know being online and zooms Man, I'll tell you, I don't know if this is true of the participants again, but, you know, these Zoom calls or webinars, and thank you for participating in, in these things, it's exhausting. So the thought of flipping through a 20-page menu um, is something that I'm not enamored with. You know, I don't even go home now and read things which I would have liked to have read in normal times, so I, you know, I listen to audiobooks now, right? Because I don't have to read or watch something. So, are we ahead? There's probably places, I, uh, you know, Asia has always been quite advanced in using technology, and so I remember them having a memory stick before I knew what what's a memory stick, right? And so, are we ahead? I don't know, Jenny. But, you know, I think what we'll see is, you know, probably customized menus as we will for personalized nutrition, right? And, you know, it, it may come to the time, Jenny, where we have the you know, Star Trek replicator at home, where we're coming back from work, or maybe we're not even at work, we're in our own home office, and we message the replicator to say, I would like X. And that X would be composed of components that meet your dietary requirements. So using, you know, AI or whatever, 3D printing, you know, all sorts of things. So, yeah, I think yeah. it's coming, Jenny. Yeah, Dr. Yada, no, that, that's a great insight. And I, I do agree with you. Um, so just based on some of my own experience, if you recall back in the days when I did my master's, I went to China for an exchange. And I remember yeah. when I got there, everyone was using their cell phones and with all these like food delivery apps or um, online shopping apps. And I was just overwhelmed because I felt like that was something I've never seen before. And now with the whole COVID situation, it seems that in Canada now we're really getting a lot more apps for food delivery or online shopping and based on my own um, profession. So I did end up volunteering at one of our PC Express um, locations um, during this time. So that was truly eye-opening to see how technology is rising these days and how we can just order groceries in front of our computer and it will be either delivered to us or packed and ready to go. So I definitely think there will be a lot of opportunities there um, down the road. Yeah, you know, Jenny, I don't even know what grocery stores will look like in the future. You know, maybe there'll be a storefront, right? And you'll probably always have the consumers who want to go in and squeeze a tomato or something like that. But, um, you know, we, we deal with that at universities. What will universities look like in the future? Will we need to have these big buildings? Right, because we need to respect social distancing and blah blah blah. So, yeah, for yeah. sure. So, come with all these challenges. What are some of the opportunities that you see um, that will be created from the current situation that we're living in today? Yeah, um, I'll start off with an educational thing. Um, you know, for those of us in the food industry, I think it's been uh, good for the food industry, right? Um, uh you know it, it has been an industry that you know is an essential service right 
Um, but how we do things will be a little bit different, I think, and the opportunities. Um, you know, as I talked about um, human capital issues, right? Um, you know, maybe we'll still have the need have the need for people to stock shelves and you know be checkout people. But I think even in the retail and probably the processing industry, you know, the whole notion of robotics and automation and mechanization, I think, is an opportunity. I think it, you know, you talk about that, and I think there's a some people think it's a threat, right? Because you know, maybe you're losing jobs of those people that would normally work on a line. Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to maybe retrain people so that they're more high tech, you know? Um, you know, there's a company in uh, Richmond, which is a suburb of Vancouver, which does pre-cut um, fruits and vegetables. And I had an opportunity to visit the plant just before, um, probably late last year, but I was blown away by how automated that plant was um, and for the volume that they produce. Um, you know, they uh, produce for, at that time, a lot of the fa uh, restaurants and fast food um, restaurants. And it was just mind blowing. And, you know, but there were people who were at control panels. There were still sanitation people. So I think there's an opportunity for us to look at how we can, especially in some of the areas that are affiliated with um, agri-food, to redefine what people think of as traditional jobs in agri-food. And if you have an opportunity, for those of you who are listening or watching today, uh, Royal Bank of Canada put out a report uh, called Farmer 4.0. Um, I probably wouldn't use Farmer as the uh, title, but it really is how Royal Bank looks at the future of the agri-food uh, area. And it talks a lot about high tech and agri-tech. And so again, for those of us in academic institutions, you know, that's probably a real draw for high school students to say, I'd like to go into uh, agriculture food. And boy, it's really kind of in step with what's really cool, right? So that's that's an opportunity, um, Jenny. I think there's also an opportunity to look at things such as high intensity farming. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, as I said, you know, one of the things that we will struggle with is as we expand our urban landscape, and we see this in Vancouver and Toronto, you know, my God, you know, when I first moved to Guelph, you know, the Guelph area was all farming. And now I think Guelph has become a bedroom community of Toronto, right? That whole strip from Toronto down to 401 to Guelph used to be farm fields, you know, and, and now it's urbanized. And so how do we supply food for an urban community? Well, maybe vertical farming. We need to get the energy thing sorted out because that's probably the big uh, downside to vertical farming. Community gardens, you know, Jenny, you, uh, you may have recalled that, you know, we had an active program with the High Vancouver School Board, in which um, they've converted some of their playgrounds, some of their green space into basically little farms which are supplying the neighborhood. And there's community gardens all over Vancouver too. And will it meet the needs completely? No, by no means, but it'll help alleviate some of that. So I think there's that opportunity, Jen Jenny, there's there's probably, you know, opportunities to look at processing technologies, you know, novel processing technologies that, you know, retain freshness. Uh, you know, that, but ensure food safe products get the microbial content down. So, you know, those are some of the, I think, some of the opportunities right now that we see with regards to COVID. Um, like most things, it, it only takes money. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sad to say, but it takes some money. You know, value add, you know, to prevent the kind of surplus things. Uh, 
um, I think is another opportunity. I had the opportunity last year to spend a month in New Zealand at uh, the University of Otago as a visiting professor. And um, the company that sponsored my visit there is a company called Haraways. Um, they're an oat company. Tradition. They're like Quaker oats. In fact, they're the Quaker oats of, of New Zealand. And my discussion with people at, at Haraways is that they were looking at diversifying their product line. So traditionally it was, you know, oats for oatmeal. That was it. Oatmeal for that or oatmeal cookies or blah, blah, blah. And now they were starting to fractionate oat and getting some value add, which, you know, you as a product developer, I think, uh, Jenny, um, sometimes you use the whole product, but sometimes you're using an ingredient from that product, you know, to get some either health benefit, you know, functionality out of it. So I think that's an opportunity for uh, us in the food industry. Yeah, great. Thank you, Dr. Yada. No, those were very great opportunities. And I'm looking forward to see how uh, things will roll out post-COVID in the near future. So we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I'm going to take a moment and turn to the questions from our audience. So I'll just go through them um, as they're submitted in the chats here. So uh, one of the first questions come our, comes from our friend uh, BJ. So VJ is wondering, do you foresee shortage of fruits and veggies this fall and winter? Well, that's a good question, uh, VJ. Um, so Parm Baines, again, referring to Parm Baines, you know, he, I would say, and he admits this, was lucky. Last year, he put in a freezing facility to take the surplus of blueberries. So, you know, what we've seen with the lockdown and closures, and, you know, we're starting to see the reopening of restaurants, but not to the capacity that we saw before. A lot of that commodity has been redirected to retail. And so, unless we get some preservation techniques and we don't foresee closures of borders, then I think we're going to be relatively okay. But if we get the closure of borders and we don't have some innovative technologies to extend, quote unquote, the fresh like product, right, uh, in the absence of freezing or drying, then we may see a bit of a shortage, right? It's going to be back to the days of when I was a kid, right? You got peaches during the summer and that's it or you got cherries for X, you got strawberries for X weeks, and that was it, so. Right, so focus yeah. on the fruits and vegetables that are in season. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, okay. BJ. Great, so the second question um, comes from Lisa. So Lisa is wondering, how have the food processors addressed the challenges in attracting and retaining a domestic workplace? And what challenges do employers foresee moving forward? Well, I, I may turn the employer one over to you, uh, Jenny, but I guess, you know, how some of the industries have met this challenge of retaining workers, whether they be domestic or foreign, is, you know, Jenny, I think your company, as well as many other companies, gave employees a supplement. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if they, I hope, you know, the, the whole notion of danger pay is kind of scary to me, uh, but, you know, they were frontline workers and they were at risk. And so part of the incentive to retain those people was to get them, to give them a premium. Um, you know, it's, it's probably gone away for some of those people, but you know, there's the whole notion of giving premiums to people, but that impacts the company's bottom line too. And so, you know, does that result in potentially an increase in food costs? I don't know, um, but it's a challenge, you know, the whole notion of giving people PPE. You know, I think in many of our stores now, or I know that, 
in BC, um, you know, going into Costco. I don't think it's a absolute requirement to wear a face mask, but they have them ready there. And I would say 95% of the people are wearing face masks. So I think what we have to do, Lisa, in the case of employees anyways, is safety first, right? It always has to be, I think, of prime uh, importance and priority. And so I think if we can try to ensure that our employees feel safe, I think that will go a long way to retention, but we probably need to incentivize it too. So Jenny, I don't know at Law of Laws, you know, um, whether or not you've seen these kind of situations where it's maybe challenging to get people to come into your retail stores or some of your production plants? Yeah, Dr. Yada, I, I totally agree with you um, with the points and the challenges and things that we're currently seeing today. I, I do have to say, I think one of the uh, biggest priorities that we are focusing on right now is keeping everyone safe, keeping our own employ employees safe and as well as our um, consumers who are coming into our stores. So I think moving forward, um, what every employer will do would be to keep social distancing, um, having very strict protocols, whether if it's working um, from the office or in the stores and really uh, ramping up the cleaning procedures just to make sure and to try to prevent any kind of outbreak that there may be, especially that we're in the food industry and we're producing um, food for everyone to consume. So safety is definitely the number one focus for everyone. Yeah, so thank you, Lisa, for that question. Um, so we have another question from a college professor, Jenny. And Jenny is saying, I am responsible to help students find replacement. And I'm wondering if you have any idea on what type of skills are the food processing companies looking for for new graduates uh, and any new skills resulted from this COVID situation. Also, do you have any idea on how to improve the chances of them finding opportunities to complete their placement hours? Yeah, um, that's a challenge, um, definitely a challenge, but I would say one of the challenges we're gonna have as educational institutions is how do we actually replace that face-to-face -face portion of a curriculum? You know, uh, laboratories. Um, you know, I think many of us who are in a food science, food technology program, you know, I think we pride ourselves on the concept of experiential learning, right? And so, you know, actually doing um, and actually applying the concepts that we hopefully are getting across in a classroom. That's gonna be challenging, right? But I'll say for us in BC, so we have a co-op program, um, probably not as good as the one at Guelph, which I know quite well, um, but we also have a master's program called the Master's in Food Science, which requires a four month internship. We've been lucky in that our students who are in that program because you know the fact that food has been uh, declared an essential service, they've been able to have that experience still. The challenges were really how do we get them out to those facilities when you know public transportation was kind of at a standstill for a while, and many of these students would have to travel to these places. That was a challenge. But I think what we have to our advantage is we have students who are in our program who become problem solvers, right? And, you know, students who come out of the Guelph program or, you know, whatever program, Manitoba, UBC, wherever, you know, oftentimes they go into a food industry and they start off doing what they refer to as boring stuff. They do quality control, quality assurance. 
But I would argue that that's really necessary for them to understand the basics of what keeps our food safe, what keeps our food functional, what keeps our food appealable to consumers, so that when the product developers are developing new products, they have a baseline of data that they can use to capitalize on to say, you know, um, we need to make sure that when we use this ingredient, this is the kind of functionality it has in some of our existing products. So, you know, replacements, I don't think we're in a situation really um, in the food area. Um, I think in the food service area, that's a, a, you know, that's another ball game, right? And the fast food restaurants because of the lockdown issue and restrictions, that's a, that's going to be problematic because many of our students, as they go through a you know undergraduate program, a diploma program, use that as cash flow to support their educational needs. That's going to be challenging. But in the food processing area, I think you know you'll see probably a reduction just because as Jenny has identified, social distancing will be the norm, and we won't be able to have probably as many employees as we normally would have seen prior to the lockdown. So a long-winded answer. I, I think we're in okay shape. Yeah. Right, and I agree with that. And I feel that a lot of placements may even um, allow students who are in those placements to also work from home. Yeah. Um, with the new norm and the new way of living and working, we've seen a huge shift from everything you can um, be done in person versus having all these virtual calls and still having the same results. And for example, sending products to your homes to evaluate them and to keep the development going, et cetera. Yeah, so Dr. Yada, there's just a couple minutes left and then we have a few more questions. So what we'll do is um, probably send you the questions after so we can have everyone covered. But before I pass it back to Rob, I just have one final question for you. So during the time of quarantine and when we all turned into working from home, what was your number one quarantine activity? Um, Zoom calls. <laughs> that was my, like, you know, I'll tell you, and probably people again can appreciate this. You know, I think people think because you're at home, you can schedule things really back to back to back to back, right? And as I alluded to, oh my God, like I'm toast at the end of the day. And so I do appreciate people plugging in to this webinar and taking time for those of you in Central Canada, taking your lunch hour to listen to me yak about things. But, you know, I would go for walks too. That was one thing. Uh, and I, and I just want to reinforce that to people, you know, take care of yourself, you know, get out there. I know that, you know, there's people out there, but, you know, be safe and, you know, wear masks or um, make sure that you adhere to social distancing, um, but get out there and do some physical activity. I think between Zoom and getting out for walks to decompress and processing, those were my isolation activities, Jenny. For sure. It's all about that balance, right? Even yeah. during these abnormal times. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Yadad. Um, so with that, uh, Rob, I'll pass the uh, speaker over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, that was excellent. I, I have to say, I really love the fireside chat. You know, I was uh, here working up an appetite the whole time looking at that hot dog. Um, uh, but, so. Uh, and uh, but on behalf of uh, CFST and Food in Canada magazine, thank you to both of you, uh, Dr. Ricky Yada and our moderator Jenny Tian. Uh, I, there is a recording of this available, so you can listen to it at your leisure. And if you don't like hot dogs, you can grab a glass of nice uh, Okanagan wine uh, oh, tonight and listen yes. to it at, at another at another time at your leisure. So um, and uh, uh, just before we go, I will say, and you've probably noticed this. Um, Ricky and Jenny do have a sort of a wonderful mentor-mentee relationship, and 
that sort of uh, helps me move into uh, just a quick announcement about our CFST 2020 mentorship program. Um, and we are currently seeking young professionals age 35 and under working or looking for work uh, in the food and beverage sector. And the mentorship program is exclusive to CFST members in good standing. So, uh, and you can learn a whole lot more about that on our website. Uh, just go to the site and look under the subheading mentorship. So any, anybody out there looking for work in the food and beverage sector, we have a whole list of mentors uh, that I think you'll find interesting. Finally, uh, this is our last webinar for the summer, and we'd like to say a special thanks to Food in Canada for partnering with us and bringing us uh, the webinar series that really emerged out of the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, we are working uh, with them on future projects, and we look forward to continuing our re relationship with Food in Canada. So uh, thank you all for attending, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. For Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thanks. Jenny. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye now. Bye. Bye.